morning, First Baptist. We get to get, I'm going to start you off with a little Bible lesson. The Bible lesson I had, I found it this morning when I did my devotions. In the Bible of Psalm, in the book of Psalms, there are 150 chapters. And in the 150 chapters, 140 times it says, I will. And I will do many things. In that, ch in that book of Psalms, it tells where David was down in the very bottom of the dust. In another place, it says that I will delight in your word, and I will not forget your words. And also in that place, it says that, God, you are my hiding place. I'm here this morning to preach, t not to preach. <laughs> I sound like I'm preaching when I tell you and th say anything about the Bible. Uh, I'm praying for Patty Brooks. Patty Brooks is the past member that uh, lives in Clarksville now, so she doesn't get here very often. And uh, her husband died, and she moved to Clarksville in an apartment, luckily enough, close to a high school friend that she hadn't seen for years. So she has many things to be grateful for, and this is what she, this is what she wants us to pray for. So bow your heads and we'll pray. In the Bible it says, 46, in Psalms 46, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. O oh Lord, we find you as our refuge. We, you rescue us and deliver us, and in your righteousness, you listen to our prayers and give answers to our needs. You are my rock, my fortress. You give us strength, comfort, guidance, guidance, and peace each day. And Patty Brooke, a sister of ours, gives you the glory, O oh Lord, for the many blessings of good health, a warm and comfortable home, and in many visits of family and friends. Thank you, God, for all that you have given her. And Father, help us all to have clean hands and pure hearts so that we may also have favor and blessings from you, O Lord Jesus Christ. I ask this in your name. Amen. Good. Good morning. Can you hear me now? Good morning, church. How are you all? Let's go ahead and stand and open up and worship this morning.
It's all because of Jesus that we are alive, that he went to the cross and died for us as sinners. And this next song, uh, Open the Eyes of My Heart, and when we get to the bridge and it says, Holy, 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 I just envision uh, just standing with Jesus in heaven and how awesome that will be just to come before him and sing, Holy, 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 I want to see you, Lord. But we can do that here in this place, and I invite you now to sing with us as we go through Open the Eyes of My Heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. to see
be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. You know, we think about that song, Holy, 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 and it's just a, it's such a great way to think about God's holiness as we enter the baptismal waters today, because when we recognize God's holiness, we realize our own sinfulness and our need for a Savior, and, and praise God that although we are not holy, although we are sinful, although we have ran from God, we've all broken God's commands. Jesus Christ came after us, and he died in our place, and he rose from the dead. He paid our debt, and uh, we can have life today when we trust in him. And so when we come to the baptismal waters today, we're not coming, uh, saying today that we have somehow became good enough, that we're coming to God. We come as those that are broken. We come as those that have realized that we can't save ourselves. We come as those who realize that we need a Savior uh, today. And today I want to invite Jeff. Uh, Radcliffe to come on down into the water with me. See, you didn't slip, so it's, it's all good. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> uh, so Jeff, this is a huge answer to prayer. Uh, Jeff uh, trusted Christ back in high school, uh, but he had never taken that first step uh, in believer's baptism. And we've been talking for a while, and I know his family has been praying for this. Many have, have mentioned this. And he's coming today to say, although he's been saved, he's trusted in Jesus, he's repented of his sins, placed in faith in Christ long ago. He's coming today to make that public uh, through believers' baptism and obedience to Jesus. Uh, can we just praise God for that? Amen. Amen. And so uh, I think this is a good encouragement to any, uh, maybe that are here today, that, that you've trusted in Jesus, but you haven't taken that first step in believer's baptism, that we don't wait. We don't wait until we're good enough. We don't wait until we get it all together. Uh, we come to Christ as we are. Um, and it's not for good people. It's for those that know they need Jesus. And so I'm super excited. Jeff has been sharing uh, just this morning again just about things God's been doing in his life, um, just in the, even in the past few months, getting to have gospel conversations with coworkers, uh, talking to people in his family about Jesus and asking them, we're there at, and we're just so excited about that because we know um, that this is not a gospel to keep to ourselves. Uh, this is something we're going to pass on. Um, but Jeff, I'm just going to ask you a couple questions. Um, have, do you believe that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life? He's fully man, fully God. Died on the cross in your place and rose from the dead. I do. All right. And have you? Are you confessing Him today as your Savior and your Lord? Upon your profession of faith, my brother, baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in death, and raised to walk in new life. Uh, God, I thank you so much for Jeff. Lord, we thank you so much for new life in Christ. We thank you so much, Jesus, for being a God that came after us, and we want to celebrate today. I celebrate his obedience. I pray that this is just uh, the beginning, Lord, of as he's taking this step, Lord, that you would continue to help him to grow. I know that, that he loves uh, his church family here at, at FBC. And, uh, Lord, I thank you for bringing him here, God. I thank you for Amber. I thank you for his entire family, Lord, and just all the ways that you're working in him through. I pray that, that he would continue to grow and mature, Lord, and be used by you um, to spread your kingdom and to spread your glory. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. service today, just celebrating new life in Jesus. Uh, if, uh, if you, well, if it's your first time here, I'd invite you to uh, reach in the pew back in front of you and uh, get that connect card. Uh, this is an awesome opportunity for us to connect with you, to pray for you. Uh, if you'd like to share any prayer requests on here, uh, or even if you want to talk about baptism, if you want to talk about baptism with, uh, with either myself or Shay or one of our deacons, uh, that would be a great way to communicate that to, to our staff and to our church family. Uh, so if you'd like to do that, go ahead and uh, check on the Connect card, and we'll have you take it out to the Connection Center and hand it to probably uh, uh, Jan, Jan back there. Uh, we'll have you do that, and uh, we'll have a sweet treat for you as well if, if it's your first time. Uh, 
I do want to make sure that we're praying for, for other churches, for other pastors as they meet in worship today. Uh, so today we're going to be praying for uh, Pastor Ben McLean at Graceland, Memphis. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, pray with me, and we'll also be praying for our lost friends uh, as we do that. Jesus, we thank you so much. We thank you for your kindness, and we thank you for the office of pastor. We thank you that you've given uh, your church shepherds, and we ask that uh, for Ben McLean and, and for, for even Shay and myself, that, that you would give us the strength by your spirit to, um, to follow you, to follow you and to lead uh, your church, your bride. And we thank you that, uh, that you've ordained that. And we pray for, for the church, for your bride. We pray that, uh, that you would give us confidence as we share your gospel. We pray that, that your Holy Spirit would be granting us strength. Um, and we pray that as we go out from this place, even this week, that you would give us strength by your Spirit to preach the gospel to those who don't know. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.
fill this place, Lord, this morning. Your glory is, is all that matters, Lord. We're here to, to praise you, Lord, and to worship you. Lord, I pray that you would uh, just speak through Nathaniel now, Lord, as he brings your word. Lord, just we ask you to fill this place with your presence. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
Amen. If you have kids uh, for Children's Church and Preschool Praise, they can be dismissed now. There's great strength in this pulpit. There's great strength in this pulpit. And it's not because it's so beautiful. It's not because it's so strong, it's so, uh, so sturdy. There's great strength in this pulpit because of the words that are spoken from it. And so many pastors, so many preachers today around the world are preaching from a pulpit very similar to this, very, very much like this. And, and they don't preach, hopefully, they don't preach what people want to hear. They don't preach, hopefully, what people, uh, what people, what makes people feel good. Hopefully, there's strength in the pulpit because of the word of God. And it, as a, as a preacher, as a pastor, it's very difficult uh, to stand behind this pulpit. Because the pulpit, with the Holy Spirit as your guide, the pulpit is where we battle, is where we fight. Flesh and blood. We don't fight with flesh and blood, but a battle of the spirit. And it's just very, it's very difficult. It's very heavy. And I don't say that to bring attention to myself. I say that to say, this is a heavy time. This is a heavy moment. And I ask that you would, uh, you would take heed to the words that are not always, help, uh, not always pleasant to your ear. Hopefully you come prepared to hear the word preached as we stand behind the pulpit. When I was in high school, I heard a quote by John Wimber uh, that said, show me what you spend your time, money, and energy on, and I'll show you what you worship, or what you value, I should say. And I recently learned that he would say this to ministry leaders as they considered their current values and how they should value things either similarly or differently as time progressed, kind of like in a, in a renovation process. What should they change and what should they keep? Show me what you spend your time, money, and energy on, and I'll show you what you value. However, my, my youth pastor at the time, he took this quote and applied it to more every part of our lives. It's, it wasn't just church development, it was in your spirit, in your own house, show me what you spend your time, money, and energy on, and he changed it to say, and I will show you what you worship. I will show you what you worship. And at that time, I really needed to hear that version, the version of uh, show me what you spend your time, money, and energy on, and I will show you what you worship. And it might sound really silly, but at the time, I was worshiping entertainment. It, it might sound silly, but all of my free time was spent on playing games on my phone and on my PlayStation as a typical high school boy. Uh, it, I remember feeling a deep conviction when my youth pastor said this, uh, because I knew that I was idolizing pleasure, the, the pleasure of being able to step out of reality for a moment and, and visualize yourself on a game, not thinking about the world around you, but just focusing on pleasure and entertainment and being distracted. But it's, it's probably more accurate for most people, for most people to consider, show me what you spend your time, money, and energy on, and I'll show you what you value. It's, it's, it's more broad, and sometimes that's more helpful. And this should be very convicting for us. It really should. Because I think if you're anything like me, if you're broken like me, sometimes what you spend your time on is not God. Not God honoring, maybe. Sometimes what you spend your money on is frivolous. Now, I'm a big fan of a cup of coffee. <laughs> Frequently. <laughs> right? I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, getting a cup of coffee. I'm not, I'm not really referring to that. I'm saying, are you worshiping God with your money? And then you think of your energy. Right? How are you spending your energy? Do you spend your energy on frivolous things, just trying to disconnect 
That's not bad in moderation. But are you spending the bulk of your energy on frivolous things? On things that hold no value in the span of eternity that aren't glorifying to God in the large uh, picture, in the greater picture of things. So this should be very convicting. And this isn't because we value evil things, but because we value created things more than the creator himself. And often this takes the form of seemingly good things, things that have great value for us personally and, and for others, how they benefit other people. And a few examples that I'll get into shortly, a few examples might be rest or work or entertainment. And, and things like these are good enough that they should be enjoyed, but dangerous enough that, uh, because they seem normal and innocent. And this is called idolatry. And the New City Catechism, question 17, defines idolatry in this way. Idolatry is trusting in created things rather than the creator for our hope and happiness, significance, and security. And idolatry doesn't have to look like bowing down before a statue. And oftentimes, in America, it doesn't look like that. Sometimes, for you, idolatry looks like valuing things that aren't as important as what you should be valuing. Exchanging good things, uh, exchanging great things for good things or even mediocre things. What are you valuing? What are you valuing? And I know this can, be, uh, this can be hard to think through, so, so I'll go back to those examples. The first example I gave was rest. Rest is good. God demonstrated that rest was good by resting after he created the world, right? He, he did this to institute the Sabbath, right, which, which you might be familiar with already, and commanded his people to rest in his goodness, to rest in his goodness and not rely on their own work, to not rely on their own way of, uh, of supporting themselves. And, and while he did that to institute the Sabbath for mankind, he also showed us that rest is, is needed. Rest is needed for us. It wasn't needed for him. He did it to be kind to us because rest is good. And I don't remember who I first heard this from, but Shea has said things that are, are similar to this. Sometimes the most spiritually healthy thing you can do is take a nap. And sometimes you just need it. However, this can quickly turn. The devil is so deceitful in turning good things into disastrous things. Sometimes the devil can turn rest into laziness, slothfulness, and complacency. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 through 9 says, How long will you stay in bed, you slacker? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the arms to rest. And your poverty will come like a robber, your need like a bandit. So another example that I gave was a job. Like working a, working a job. For men especially, it's very important to hold a consistent job if they're able, right? Ability is a, is a great factor in this. And I say especially men because in large part, we are in charge of providing for the family, providing for, for our, our, our wives, our kids. And it's incredibly important, so much so that Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, that if anyone isn't willing to, er, to work, he should not eat. And however, right, turning a, a good thing into a disastrous thing, when you don't get the hours that you need, or the pay that, that you think you need, and, and your bills aren't, aren't lining up, and, and you don't have the money to pay what you need to pay, it, it's, it can lead you to anxiety. And I've been there, maybe, maybe you've been there, where it leads you to anxiety. And instead of what the Lord once gave to be good, we turn it to anxiety. And instead of trusting the Lord, we say, how will I provide? 
How will I pay the bills? What will I do? Do you see the, do you see the flip? Our hearts quickly turn good gifts into sin. And the third example that I provided was entertainment. And that's been my idol, one of my many, for many years, right? This is, this is something that I struggle with personally. And for me, it takes the form of my phone. But for you, it might take the form of the television in your home or sports, for example. And I think my phone is a good thing. And I think a television could be a good thing. I think sports can be a very good thing. For my phone, it allows my wife to keep a loving eye on me, right? She knows where I am all the time. And uh, <laughs> it allows me to stay in contact with my church family, right? So that you can contact me when, when you need to get a hold of me. It holds all, of my, all the pictures of my kids so that I can show them off to you and show how cute they are. And I love them so much and they're great. And on that same phone, you can see news stories that lead you to hate your neighbor for differing views, that leads you to, uh, to see disastrous things that are disastrous for your spiritual health. The good thing is quickly turned into a destructive thing. Philippians chapter 3, verse 19 says, Their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. And they are focused on earthly things. And this metaphor, their God is their stomach, refers to someone who chases after their own pleasures. Right? That's been me. And maybe it's been you. Either now or in your past or possibly in your future for a time. So to revisit John Wimmer's quote, quote from earlier, what do you spend your time, your money, and your energy on? And do you spend it primarily for God's kingdom and for his people? We live in a time that's so clouded by distractions. And, and sadly, I think that the devil is doing a great job at deceiving us, all of us. I'm not pointing the finger at any individual saying, you know, wagging my finger at anyone. I think the devil sometimes does a great job at deceiving. So as we continue through our, our little mini-series on time, talent, and treasure, we come to the topic of time. Right? How are you spending your time? And as Shea preached about talents last week, we considered what it looked like to offer our talents to God through his church. And today, we'll look at how we're supposed to devote our time to God, and in part, through our devotion to his church. So we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 25, and I'll give you a moment to flip there. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 25. Uh, but we're going to be primarily focusing on verse 24 through 25. So... Uh, Hebrews is in the New Testament after Philemon and before James. Uh, it's in the back quarter of your Bibles if you're, if you're flipping there. So if you are able and willing, I would like to invite you to stand in honor of God's word as we read today's passage. God's word says to us today, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in, our, in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you so much for your kindness to us that you would condescend yourself to speak to us, we thank you that you have so kindly spoken to us, a fickle people. And Father, we pray that you would, uh, that you would by your spirit, be softening our hearts to receive your word. Um, and I pray that 
for myself, that you would continue to give me strength to preach it unashamedly. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So Hebrews is a very intriguing book that is just covered with mystery. Its author and recipients aren't known for certain, though there's some speculations. Uh, but we can be certain of this, that the author of the letter has great concern for his audience. And I should make it very clear that his concern is not about judgment. His concern is not about thinking that he's better than other people. His concern is out of love. His love for his people, people that he, he seems to uh, take ownership of. He has great concern for them because he loves them. And he primarily seems concerned about their faith, wanting them to endure trials and temptations and not leave their savior. Several times he tells them to proceed with caution as they navigate the Christian life, and I'll, I'll just rattle off some for you. In chapter two, verse one, he says, we must pay attention all the more to what we have heard so that we will not drift away. Chapter three, verse 12, he says, watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be any of you, so there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. In other words, he's warning them to be mindful of their own hearts, for even they can fall away from God. In chapter 4, verse 14, he tells them to hold fast to their confession. Chapter 6, verse 12, he tells them not to be sluggish, but imitators of other believers. Chapter 12, verse 3, he calls them to not grow weary or faint-hearted in the faith. In chapter 12, verse 7, he calls them to endure and embrace discipline, saying, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Just as an, an aside, um, these people... I'm, I'm making a speculation, but I think it's, it's somewhat reasonable. I don't want to make assertions about this. This is just a speculation. There are probably people in this church who seem like God-fearing Christians, and we don't know until later in their lives, as, as 1 John helps us understand, we don't know until later in their lives if they are faithful or not. Time has a, has a great way of showing the faithfulness of a person. And we ought not say, I, I bet you have seen this in your life, we ought not say that it won't be us. We ought not say that it won't be us who leaves the faith. And we ought not say of our neighbor in the pew or our neighbor in our neighborhood that it won't be them. It's so important. It's so important, and I'm very passionate about this. Um, I mean, in recent years, I've, I've seen several, several of my friends leave the faith. People of whom I said, it will never be them. And maybe you've experienced a similar thing. Maybe it's with a child. Maybe it's with a parent. Maybe it's with a childhood friend that you grew up with. Maybe it's someone who, maybe you sat in these very pews with who is no longer following Jesus. It, we ought not say that it would never happen to us. We ought not say that it will never happen to our loved ones. And that is why he says this today. He says, take care, not because they don't seem like Christians, but because they do, and we ought to take care because it could be you and it could be me. We don't know, only time will tell. There's great concern because anyone can turn away from Christ, and the author doesn't want it to be them, just as I don't want it to be you, you don't want it to be me. Look to the person to your left and to your right. You don't want it to be them. There is great concern, and it's not simple. It's not simple. And out of concern, out of a sincere, loving concern 
for his recipients. He calls them to take care in verses 24 and 25. And to refresh your memory, it says, and let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. So I have one point. I'm not particularly clever. Uh, I have one point, and it, I hope that you take this away. It says, do not neglect to meet together. I think that's his primary call. I think that's what, he, what he's trying to get after in this verse, though I would encourage you to read the book of Hebrews, and he says, take care in so many things, just so many things. Not because he thinks they're not believers, but because he thinks they are, and you must take care. The major call today is to not neglect to meet together. And from the looks of it, there are at least some people in the church or some people in surrounding areas that are neglecting to meet together. That's why I think he would probably say it. And to neglect the gathering, to neglect the worship service, I think, is to consider that other things are more profitable. To consider, at least in your heart, at least in part, not in your whole demeanor, but maybe in part, that other things are more important. I think we spend our time doing things that we think are valuable. I think we, we spend our money in things that we think are valuable. And what is that saying? What is that saying about you? I'm not making any accusations. I'm not making any accusations about you. I want the Holy Spirit to be working in your heart to reveal that to you. Because I can't know everything about you. I can't know what you do in secret. But the Holy Spirit does. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would be working in you even now. And as we read that, the, the don't neglect to meet together, I think it's fair and reasonable to then ask, what does it look like to meet together? When he's saying don't neglect to meet together, what is meeting together? What does that mean? Or you might be asking a slightly different question, what do I have to attend that makes me have a check mark in this area? And I think with a good heart, that's, that's okay. Because it's really trying, with a good heart, it's trying to figure out what he's talking about. But with a, with a deceived heart, it says, what do I got to do? What do I got to do to be good? It's just so likely that Satan will tempt us, so, uh, that he will tempt us to not attend, to not uh, be a part of the meeting, to neglect the meeting. So what did it look like for the early church to meet together? How often did they meet? I think that'll help us understand more of what they're, what they're trying to say. And if you'd like, you can turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Uh, I'll, it'll be on the screen behind me if you don't want to turn there, but we're going to take a brief hiatus in Acts chapter 2. And I'll read verse 41 through 47 for us. It reads, So those who accepted his message were baptized. This is Peter's message. And that day, about 3,000 people were added to them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day... They devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. Every day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. I think they met together frequently. I think that's the only reading that you can take from this. They met together frequently, so frequently that it says they were devoted to the fellowship in verse 42. And in verse 46, it says they met together every day in the temple and ate together in the houses every day. 
So when we read in Hebrews chapter 10 the call to not neglect to meet together, it seems reasonable that at the very minimum it's attending today. It's attending, it's attending next Sunday. And I think it's also reasonable to participate in the church and in and, and its mission. Oh, it's not there. What we would call the discipleship pathway, worship community discipleship mission, to be here in worship, to worship in your homes, to worship individually, to be a part of a community group, a discipleship group, and to be on mission, I think it's reasonable that if they are meeting together every day, that we would participate in as much as we are able in the mission of the church. Now, I wanna provide a caveat, because I know that there are some who are not able, and I'm not talking about that. I'm not referring to that. I'm not casting, casting shame or blame on any individual who is sincerely, with good conscience, unable to be here. I understand that, and I don't have any animosity towards those people. I think they deserve our prayers, and they need them. I'm not referring to those people. But we do these things. We do these things in participation with the local church for God's glory. For your good and for God's glory. And I'm very passionate about attendance, obviously, if the, that should be clear. I'm very passionate about attendance and just overall church involvement. And I'm passionate, and I may seem overzealous. I may, I may come off that way. But it's because I love you very deeply. I have a great love for you. And you people are so awesome. <laughs> So recently, this past week, marked our one-year anniversary, Mark Caitlin's and I's one-year anniversary of being at FBC. And you people have been so kind to us. You have loved us so much. And you have, you have had great humility as you've loved us. And, and you have just welcomed us as family. As, as you probably know, we don't have biological family here, and you guys have been our family, and you have welcomed us. And I have a great love and thankfulness in my heart for you people. <laughs> and it's because I love you that I say we cannot neglect to meet together. I think at FBC, and I, I say this with all, all sincerity, I think this is one of Satan's greatest deceptions on us temporarily. I, 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 don't, I don't think that this is forever, for, for God will not let Satan overcome his church. And this is not making a declaration about anyone's salvation. I think that the, uh, the, the enemy has deceived us because he is very crafty. I think he's deceived us. And we've thought, well, I attend once a month. I attend twice a month. I think this is the biggest sickness, spiritual sickness in our body today. And I say that with all love. It's not loving for a doctor to tell you that you're not sick when you are very ill. It's loving for him to address the situation and give you medicine. And I, I think it will prove helpful to you in your spirit uh, to say why, why we must spend our time worshiping together uh, as, as a church. And I think we gather primarily, though I, I think you could say other things, for our neighbor and for our God. We gather for our neighbor and for our God. From the passage, it seems that their lack of meeting together is problematic because they're neglecting one another. That's why it's, I mean, they're not encouraging one another. They're not provoking love and good works in their brothers and sisters in Christ. They're not doing it because they're not able, because they don't 
meet. And, and I, I know a lot of you are very weary. I know a lot of you are very tired. And, and in coming here, you are expressing a great act of strength and courage. You're very tired. Activities that, that you've committed yourself to that are good things, activities that you've committed yourself to have made you tired. Whether, whether it be with, uh, with kids, with their school, with, with work, with, uh, with other things. You know, kind of fill in the blank. Look at your schedule and, and fill in those blanks. We're a very busy people. And busyness isn't evil. But it makes you tired. Remember, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. It's true. It's true. I think we're tired. And I have great, great sympathy for that. I will not say that it is not true. I will not say that, that just, you know, just get up there and do it. Gosh darn it, you just, you just get it done. Hey, get her done. Just do it. Suck it up, buttercup. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be tone deaf. I think you come here and you're tired. And I would, I would lovingly consider you to take a step back, look at your calendar, and say, am I neglecting the meeting? Am I neglecting my brother, my sister in Christ? Am I neglecting the gathering? Am I able to, with my attendance, to stir up my brother and sister in Christ in love? Am I able to do that with my level of participation today? I think so many of you are doing this so well, and there are so many, so many individuals that I can, that I, I see even now that are fantastic. I would consider you even still to take a step back and to say, what am I spending my time, my money, my energy on? What am I valuing? So we gather for our neighbor. We gather to stir our neighbor up, to encourage our neighbor, and we gather because of what God has done for us. Now, I've said this many times throughout my year here, and I've said it before that, and I'll say it until I'm dead. We don't worship Jesus because of what he's done for us. We worship Jesus because of who he is. He could give us nothing, and he would deserve everything. We don't deserve heaven, we don't deserve salvation, and that's why it's called a grace. That's why it's called uh, grace that he would condescend himself to love us. He doesn't, he doesn't only give us stuff so that we praise him, it's who he is that we praise. So we gather because of what God has done for us, and it's through his cross. And I know I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll move quickly. But I, I really want to close with, with a more extended reading of Scripture. Because I think that I can summarize the gospel. I've done that before. Shay's done that before. We've done that. I want us to read from God's word what God has done. And then I want to ask you to respond. So, so I'll read out of Romans chapter 5 verse 6 through 11, and I think this encapsulates why God is so good and what goodness he has done for us and how we gather as the church to love him, to worship him. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about God and your neighbor. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 11 says, for while we, will, we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. 
For rarely will someone die for, just a pers- uh, for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps, someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. And this is all about his death and his burial and his resurrection. This Jesus, this Christ who who Paul talks about, is God, God in the flesh. And he came and he lived a sinless life, the life that you couldn't live, the life that you were unable to live. And he did that because he has a great love for you that is shown chiefly through Jesus And the Son, Jesus Christ, he lived this sinless life, and the religious leaders of his day and the political leaders of his day hated him for it, and they crucified him. But that was according to God's plan, because it was through Jesus' death, through his crucifixion on the cross, that you, if you believe and trust in him and make him the Lord of your life, that you can also receive it. And that's why we gather. We gather in in proclamation, in anticipation for the Lord's coming. So as I invite the band back on stage, I'd like to ask you that you would seriously, seriously pray about what the Lord is asking you to do today. I don't think that I can speak into every situation, give up this thing, give up that thing, do this thing, pick up that. I don't don't think that I can speak into every situation with one sentence, (laughs) except for this, that you would not neglect to meet together as some are in the habit of doing, but in proclamation that we would, uh, that we would, uh, how do I say that? that we would proclaim the Lord's coming as we meet. So if the Holy Spirit is convicting you and calling you to turn from your sins, I'd ask that you either come up and and pray at the altar as we continue to worship uh, during this next song or that you'd find me after the service. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to explain more about who this Jesus is, why we gather, and what he has done for you. So would you please pray with me? Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your kindness. And we ask that you would correct us. We ask that you would direct our steps. We know that that we are a people who are so quick to wander. We're so quick to be distracted. And we know that our enemy is crafty, but we know that you have overcome the grave. We know that you have overcome our enemy and that you are so much stronger. We thank you for your victory. We thank you for your victory through your death, through your burial and resurrection, and we pray that, uh, that you, by your spirit, would be leading people to respond today. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So as we continue to worship, consider coming down to the altar. I'll invite up the prayer team to, uh, to be here to, to pray with you guys. And, uh, yeah, consider what the Spirit is telling you today. You may stand and worship. guides
my heart Lord I Amen. You guys can be seated. Um, I mean, what a powerful message um, this morning uh, from Nathaniel. I appreciate you uh, sharing that and encouraging us all from, from God's Word uh, this morning. So, being a part of the body of Christ, as we've already heard this morning, is a big deal. Like, committing uh, to be a faithful member of the church, to spur each other on, to love each other. Uh, to encourage one another to gather together is a huge deal. Uh, it's a huge blessing and a huge responsibility. And uh, back in the fall, I can't remember, if it was, I guess it was October, right? Uh, Will and Sarah Jackson went through our new members class uh, here at FPC. And they're coming uh, this morning uh, just to share their desire to unite uh, with First Baptist uh, through church membership. And if you know Will, you might know him as Marty, if you've been here long enough. So Will or, or Marty uh, Jackson. But super excited about that. I want to invite you guys to come up. Um, so 
I've got a couple things I'm going to just share about what that means, and then I'm going to ask you guys as a church uh, to make a commitment as well this morning, because it's not just that Will and Sarah are coming to unite with us as, as members, but it's that we as a body are welcoming them, we're receiving them, and we're committing to them uh, that we're going to do what God has called us to do as the body of Christ, to help them and to encourage them and to love them. So when we talk about uh, church membership, we don't want to do anything other than what Scripture has called us to do as church members, right? And that's, that's what we stand on. And so uh, some of the things that we talked about is seeking to live in unity uh, by not gossiping, acting in love towards members, following leadership. And then we've got verses that, are, that, we, that we quote there from Romans 15.9, Romans 15.5, 1 Peter 1.22, Hebrews 13.7. We talk about sharing the responsibility of the church by being involved in, in community. Uh, living out the one another's, praying for the lost, inviting and welcoming the unchurched, and attempting to share Christ. We talked about serving uh, the ministry of the church by discovering gifts and talents that God has given you and using them to serve Christ. Like it talks about in 1 Peter 4.10, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. And then we support the testimony of the church by attending corporate worship regularly, attempting to grow in Christ's likeness, and giving regularly. So they're coming this morning saying they want to do that. They want to pursue Jesus with us. They want to live on mission with us, and I'm super excited because I've been looking forward to this for a while, um, but super excited about that, but FBC, I want to say again, we have a huge responsibility as a church family, that when people come into the body of Christ, that there's a calling for us as well, and so I want to ask you this morning, I'm going to ask you to answer at the end with an amen, if you agree with this, but do you have Will and Sarah's back? Are you going to be here for them? Are you committed to pray for them, to live in community with them, to love them, to hold them accountable, to co-labor beside them for the mission of Jesus, to encourage them and to spur them on with the hope of the gospel, and to do everything in your power to help them grow up into maturity in Christ. If you do, say amen. 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 Praise God. We love you guys, and we're very, very excited about that. I'm going to pray, pray for you all. Um, God, I thank you so much uh, for Will and Sarah. I thank you for their testimonies as believers in Christ. Uh, that they have been born again, that they've been baptized, Lord, and that they, they are living on mission for Jesus, and they already are, God, and I thank you for that. I pray that you continue to bless their marriage, continue to use them, help us as a church family to love them, to encourage them, to spur them on, to pray for them, and, Lord, that we would co-labor uh, beside them. And, and, God, we just give you the glory for that, Lord. We thank you for calling us, God, out of the darkness into your marvelous light and for equipping us, and I thank you for each person here. And I thank you for the message this morning that we've heard, God. I pray that we would um, continue to gather, Lord, continue to worship together, to continue uh, to love each other, God, and to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Uh, and to remember, Lord, that you are coming back, God, and we look forward to that day, and we give you the praise for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And you guys can sit down. All right. Just a, a couple of other things that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for our, for our offering, um, which has an offering here in a moment. One thing I do want, I know Nathaniel mentioned it earlier, but we are celebrating one year anniversary for Nathaniel and Caitlin. We praise God for them. <laughs> praise God for them coming here. Praise God for their faithful gospel ministry, their encouragement that they are, I know, to my family and to so many others here. Um, and just, uh, just praise God for you guys. Praise God for Atlas and Talitha and, and just the encouragement that you are to me. And I think there's something to be said for even what he said this morning about the way that we encourage one another just by gathering. Um, together, I've been encouraged today uh, from all that God is doing, from Jeff, from, the, from his baptism, from Nathaniel's word, from Will and Sarah joining the church, and for being together in worship with our church family. Just from hearing you guys sing to Jesus and, and pray, um, that encourages me. Uh, and I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't feel it. Like, I don't feel like coming to church. I don't feel like um, pursuing. And, and we, do, we do the hard things uh, for the glory of God, and God uses that to grow us and equip us, as Nathaniel already said. I'm not going to preach again because you did an excellent job in the sermon, but it was really good. A um, couple things. Tonight, 6.30 here, we have our, our corporate prayer meeting. I invite you to come to that. We're going to have some of the worship team doing some songs for us. We're going to spend time in prayer together as a body. We do this once a month where we come together for a time, and I would just encourage you that this is, is very important for us as a body. Uh, to come together in this way. And, and I want to encourage you, if at all possible, to be a part of that. We want to pray for each other. We want to lift one another up. 
And corporate prayer is a very powerful thing. Uh, God moves when we pray. And it's a great opportunity to lift up the burdens and needs of those in the body and to encourage one another in that way. And then the, the other thing that I would encourage you about is the table. It's, start, it's starting next Sunday after service. It's going to be an awesome time. We're coming together, table groups, right after the service. We're going to have a meal together, uh, share some time in community together, talk about how we're going to apply the Word of God to life. I encourage you, if you haven't done so, I know a lot of you guys already have, to RSVP to this by Tuesday. If you don't RSVP by Tuesday, we will not have enough food for you because we are buying the food based on the people that are coming. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't done that yet, to RSVP to that and, and to, to make that a priority to come and, and spend some time with the church family. And I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray for our offering now as so we move it to this time. God, we thank you so much, uh, Lord, for being a God that is good to us, Lord. We thank you that, that Lord, you, you're a God that comes after us, Lord, that, you, that we didn't first love you, but that you loved us, God, and you gave yourself for us. And I pray that this morning that as we give, Lord, we recognize that, that all of our funds, all of our finances, every good and perfect gift comes from you. And Lord, I pray that we would give this back now as an act of worship to you, that we give of our tithes and offerings, that we would do it cheerfully. And God, that you could multiply these gifts for the furthering of your kingdom. Help us to be good stewards. And Lord, uh, that you would be glorified so that more people uh, could come to saving faith in Jesus. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just come thanking you again for this very blessed day. Heavenly Father, thank you for our many blessings. We pray, Heavenly Father, thank you for the one that's brought your message to us this day. And we pray if there's any here that needed to make a decision for you this day, Lord, be with them too. And we just pray now, Heavenly Father, that You'll go with us as we leave here. Forgive us where we failed thee, and we give you all the praise and glory for it all. Thank you.